it's October, and this month and into November, I wanted to do something a little different to fit this season. It's a season where we tell ghost stories. It's a season where we have pumpkins on our porches. It's a time where it's spooky and haunting and all of that good stuff. And so our Bible study for the next five study sessions is going to be a little different. We are going to look at tales from beyond. We're going to look at tales that defy uh, the norm. We're going to look at stories from the Bible that are very different, that if I can say it may be a little spooky. Now, I'm not being disrespectful of the scriptures. Every story in the Bible, every passage in the Bible, we study as Christians. We look at the Old and New Testaments for our discipleship and our faith formation and our growth. But sometimes there are stories that are hard to understand. Sometimes there are stories that stick out a little bit and is unusual. I have found five right here that are different than the norm. A story of a witch and a ghost. A story of a monster from the deep. A disembodied hand writing a message cryptically on the wall. An army of skeletons and demon-possessed crazy people in a cemetery. Now, if I had described those stories to you and I didn't tell you they were in the Bible, you would think it's a, some type of movie series or TV series, The Twilight Zone or George Romero or Stephen King. And they are quite like that. They're very unusual. But because they're scripture and they're sacred, they speak to us about everyday life and we're going to figure that out. They help us and they guide us and I'm not going to take the stories lightly at all. But in this season of the year, or this fall season, what a great time to explore these stories that seem from beyond. And so, if you know me, you know I like a little spookiness, a little ghost tale here and there. And so, I'm intrigued by this. And so, I've kind of hyped this up a little bit for the last few weeks to get you ready for it. So, if you are ready, we're going to do spooky stories from the Bible. Are you ready to get started? Are you ready? Well, let's do it. They're everywhere. And the stories of ghosts are everywhere. My grandparents told ghost stories, probably yours did too. I tell my children ghost stories. Ghost stories are on TV, ghost stories are swapped at the grocery store, and as people tell tales, and ghost stories are all around us, and they have been forever. In the church building we're at, you ask the youth and the children in our church, there are ghost stories in our church. Oh, yes, up on the fifth floor. There are folks who say they have heard voices and singing and walking through the halls and all kinds of unusual experiences. Oh, you bet. Now, is it our imagination? Is it just, uh, I tell you that, and now next time you come to the fifth floor, you hear the air ducts, and maybe you think it's a ghost? We have our logical folks who say, absolutely, there are no ghosts. It doesn't make sense. It's just your imagination. Others say, oh, no, my grandmother told me this story. It happened to her, or it happened to me. I suspect those of you walk, uh, watching this today, some of you have some ghost stories that you have personally experienced or that have been told to you in the family. What do we do with such tales? What do we do? We certainly love to watch them on the movies. They've been around forever. We certainly like to think about them and tell them. And my goodness, they're, they're the best kind of story to tell on a hayride. When I was a kid, we used to take hayrides as a youth group, load up a wagon full of hay, tractor rather than horses would pull it, but we would go out into the country roads of Kentucky and we would sit in the back and we would swap some ghost stories. Some were just versions of familiar tales that have been told and retwisted and repurposed, but others were unique and personal. And then we would have a bonfire, and this was always in October, and we would make s'mores and hot dogs and laugh and sing songs. Great memories. As Christians, though, what do we do with this? Do we believe in ghosts? Are ghosts scriptural? Or we believe we die and we go to be with God? So what's this business about ghosts? Who are these people running around? Are ghosts literal people trapped on earth trying to fulfill some final message, trying to get something across to us, trapped and unable to move beyond because they're unsettled? Is it, perhaps maybe they have gone on, and maybe what we see as ghosts are just like a reflection, an after to kind of a, um, just a lingering impact, not really the person themselves, but some kind of lingering residue left behind, like a fingerprint on a window. And so we're just seeing an image from the past. Hmm. Or is it all just hokiness? Well, I can't get started until I tell you a few ghost stories of my own. How would you like to hear that? Well, 
I like to go on ghost hunts. And we were one day in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and they had a ghost tour scheduled. And so Katie and the kids joined me as we went, and they're great because you learn a lot about history. And we went to an orphanage there, a haunted orphanage. It's an orphanage with a sad tale that goes far back to the Civil War, a, a place where children after the Civil War, or rather their children who were orphaned, wound up living, and the headmistress, the teacher, came from, well, they didn't know. She just sort of showed up in town, and she came to lead that school. Stories of abuse and horror filled the street conversations, and people began to worry about what was going on in that orphanage, and sure enough, it was terrible, and this part's historical. It was terrible the way she treated those children. She ruled that place with an iron fist, and the tales were just awful, awful. So before they could arrest her, before they could go after her, she disappeared as surely as she came, and she was gone. The orphanage became haunted ground, and to this day, all kinds of sights are seen around there, noises and bumps in the middle of the night. We went down to the basement where she would punish the children and lock them down there because they were bad. We went down there, and we listened to the tales, and there was a back area where there were toys everywhere. And she said, people will come and leave toys for the ghost children. And that sometimes you'd come back and the toys would be moved. And they turned the lights off and they told us to wave our cameras around. And then when they turned the lights on, they told us to look at our cameras. And you'd see little flecks of light in your camera. And they said they were ghost orbs. Well, my scientific mind says it's probably dust reflection. They know this happens and it plays into it. But while we were there, I did go by a building, a house called... Um, uh, go paranormal investigators. And these were people who sold gear to, yes, people who are actually ghost hunters. And I went in and I spoke to some of the ghost hunters and they told some great tales and they swore it was true. I wasn't offended. I have no idea. I've never died and been a ghost. Um, I have no idea. My son swears he saw a ghost once. The children in church say they heard things on the fifth floor. But, uh, I've got my tales from the family as well as you do. Well, we'll revisit this idea of ghosts before it's over, whether we can believe in them or not, because it is an interesting conversation. But you came here for a Bible study, so I'm going to tell you about the witch of Endor and the ghost she conjured up, the original conjuring. We can talk a little bit about witchcraft if you want as well. I don't know. But uh, this is an interesting story. It is found in the pages of the Bible. And it is found in 1 Samuel chapter 28. I encourage you to take time. If you're watching this video, maybe pause the video right now. Get your Bible out. Find 1 Samuel 28 and read that chapter. Go ahead. Do that now. Pause the video. Go read it. And then come back and watch what we have to say about this chapter. As we think about 1 Samuel 28, let me give you a little background. Saul, the first king of a united monarchy has failed time and time again, and God is preparing to replace him with David, a shepherd boy. These are tense days. The great prophet Samuel, who chose both of them to be kings, who has been a source of wisdom and comfort for the people, he's dead. And the enemies, the Philistines, are at the door. They are fighting Israel, and Saul is terrified. He has no one to turn to. That prophet, that great man, Samuel, is gone dead. And so now he seeks God himself, but God is silent because Saul never listens to God, and so God has stopped speaking back. Saul has chased all of the people who practiced spiritism and mediums and those who contacted the dead and conjured the spirits. He had chased them from the land as he should have, for that was not what God wanted the people to do. But now in his time of despair, what he does is go to those from whom he knows he shouldn't. The very people he chased away. And this story they call the Witch of Endor occurs. The witch is a woman who can conjure spirits from those who have died. And she's still there and she's terrified because she knows what the king has decreed. And the king has come into disguise, which is of course evidence that he knows he's doing wrong. And he gets there. And amazingly, this woman is able to call a prophet from the grave, a ghost, who speaks to Saul and tells him that he will die. 
that he has failed and that the enemies will defeat him and the people. This story is shocking. Saul is shocked. He can barely move. He can barely eat. And this medium takes care of him and just wants to get him out of the house. When she first saw him, she was concerned because of the king's decree. And then when she saw what was going on, she was even more shocked. She just wanted the thing to end. She knew something big was happening and she wanted no part of it. What a story. What are we to make of this? Ghosts and mediums and rebelling kings. What does this story teach us? Let's figure it out together. Wow. Let's dig deeper. Are you ready? First off, can we say this is an amazing story? I don't know about you, but I suspect many of you have never heard it. It's not one I don't think I've ever preached on. I don't know if it shows up in Sunday school. It's the we all talk about how Saul's a lousy king and he fails, but this, he's talking to a medium and then a ghost speaks to him. You can see why I chose this to kick off this study. So let's dig deep. It's amazing the stories in the Bible. Many would have problems with magic and ghosts and mediums, you bet. But, as interesting as it is, we have some questions. Who is this woman again? Again, some people call her a witch. I wouldn't call her a witch. Uh, not like Oz, at least, which I love the Wizard of Oz. Uh, the word in Hebrew means a woman, possessor of an ob, which is a Hebrew word, at Endor. And the word ob has been suggested by some to refer to a ritual pit for summoning the dead from the netherworld. And this is based on Near Eastern and Mediterranean cultures. So basically, she's known as a woman who possesses a pit that allows her to bring up ghosts. Not the idea of the Wiccan religion today, or not the idea of the popular images of witches, but definitely somebody who's into the dark arts pulling up the dead people. Not someone that a king who serves God should be going to see. Now the word has other, uh, the word in other languages shows up as well. This kind of idea, this kind of woman does exist in many of the religions, excuse me, many of the cultures around where the Hebrews are. So these type of people existed there. And this uh, ritual is, has parallels in Babylonian and Hittite magical writings. Uh, some talk about it in different ways, but this is not, would not be a foreign idea in this world. And it would have been bad for a king to see her. That's the thing to know. Okay. It asks, leads me to ask a question about this. This woman is a, like a medium who talks to dead people. Can we talk to dead people? Can we really do that? Can we pull up ghosts and speak to them? Can she do this? Wouldn't this be, like, we know these people existed. We know they exist now. But does it work? Or is she faking? And, you know, I've seen movies. There was a scary movie once where it starts out where the woman's a medium and she's got all these things, magical, I mean, not magical, but mechanical means by which she makes the table moves and scares everybody all to get money. Is this just somebody who just plays on your imagination? I mean, but the text does say that he saw the dead prophet, not just her. So it seems like, at least in this story, it worked. And maybe it surprised her. Maybe she'd been a faker all the time, and she's shocked that a ghost shows up. Maybe God allowed the prophet to come back to warn Saul, and maybe she's as surprised that a ghost showed up as he is. And that's possible. So she's a fraud, and now she's shocked because God does something. Or maybe she is in league with demons and evil creatures and spirits and she does this all the time and through evil she is able to let people speak either to ghosts or pseudo-ghosts. Maybe it's not a ghost. Maybe it's a... Some believe that when they think they're talking to Cousin Eddie, it's some kind of creature. But in this story, it doesn't look like that because in this story, the prophet, even though he's dead, is speaking the way the prophet would speak. The truth from God. He knows that these guys are going to die. He knows that they have defied God. I mean, what he says is godly. So that's interesting. Okay, we'll come back to some of this. Hang on. Let's talk about what happens after the text real quick. And then I got some more questions. The next day, it comes true. See, God is not a God of lies. The army is defeated as prophesied. Saul is fatally wounded by the Philistines. And in two different tellings of this event commits suicide by falling on his own sword, or he asks someone to strike him down. You see two versions there. But basically, this all leads to his downfall, and David becomes king, and Saul is gone, just as it said. 
Okay, so how do religious people take a scripture like this? Or even the idea of ghosts and mediums? How do we take it? Uh, since this passage has been out, yes, many Christians and Jewish people have wrestled with it because it is holy scripture. Uh, and so some have felt, in fact, that it is a trickery and have said that she was a ventriloquist and a fraud. And I can buy that with most of the people that come to see her, that she, again, is a trickster. The, there is a word here that's kind of like ventriloquism. Like she's a, there's a theory that she's like a ventriloquist and she's a theory and, I don't know, it gets really complex, but basically she's a fraud. And she's just, just faking. But in this case, something happened. Maybe she had heard these things, and so she's telling him what she had heard. And maybe God is using her to warn him. You know, there's that theory. Uh, in Judaism, there are many ideas about the afterlife, just like there are among Christians, um, about how the afterlife plays. Uh, and there are ideas about ghosts and spirits and, and sort of the folk idea that Jews have, but maybe not in the... Let me put it this way. We have our Christian theology, and we are Christians, but we have sort of a folk idea about how things happen. We have superstitions. We have uh, myths and ideas that we've created in popular culture or ancient culture that has nothing to do with the Bible. You know, like a black cat is bad luck. Don't walk under a ladder. Put some salt over your shoulder. So we have all these things that people used to do, and even today, superstitions and all this, and we have ghost stories that are, you know, whatever. But the bottom line is this ghost shows up and tells the prophet, excuse me, tells the king exactly what the prophet would have said. So it goes back that somehow God is using this event to warn the king. Makes us wonder, though, what about ghosts? Can we believe in ghosts? Well, hang on to that. Lots of great stuff here, so let's dig into them. First step, are ghosts real? That's the question. Are ghosts real? There are people who believe, yes, and there are people that believe, no, and your preacher can say, I don't know. I do believe the Bible is clear that we are not trapped on this moral, mortal coil to roam in chains for the rest of eternity. If we believe in Christ, if we are Christians, then when we leave this planet, we go to be in the presence of God. So I know that. I do not believe that we are trapped here. So whatever we see or believe when it comes to these spooky things that we all tell these tales about, it's not your spirit, your essence that is trapped here. I don't know what it is, so I can't answer it. I can't answer, I'm not going to say that what you saw was or wasn't true because I wasn't there. I'm going to say I don't know, but I can tell you to comfort you that when we die and when your loved ones die, they go to be with God in heaven. Whatever we're hearing in the, on the fifth floor or in your attic or basement, that I don't know. If you are hearing it, if it's imagination, superstition, uh, jeepers creepers, or whether it's something else, I, I don't know. But, but you as a being, as a human being, your soul, your spirit, your essence, if you trust in God, you go to be with God. That I believe fully is scriptural. This other stuff, I don't know. It's beyond my understanding. I might have some personal opinions, but I won't even give those to you because then you'll say, well, the pastor said, and, and I'm not an expert on this. What about uh, witches? I'm not, I don't think it's good for us to practice witchcraft and to be, and, and yet I would say the wit, this is not about witchcraft, even though it's not good to be a witch. Um, that's a earth worship. It's a spirit worship. It's a, a pagan, considered a pagan religion today, but that's not what this is. So is it good to be a medium to speak to ghosts? No. I would not put that in as a profession if I were you. I don't think as Christians that's that is our goal, is to set up shop and have people talk to dead people. I think our goal is to have people talk to God. The only ghost we should be connecting people to is the Holy Ghost. Bad joke, but you get the point, the Holy Spirit. We need to be careful because that's just not our focus as Christians. And I think most, I will say this, that the majority of this kind of stuff is fake and fraudulent. Somebody playing on your hopes, your dreams, I'm very cynical on psychics and mediums and all that. I think I would say overwhelmingly they're pulling your leg to play upon your emotions to get your money or whatever. But can somebody have an experience out of this world? I'll leave that between you and your experience if you've had that. But I would not allow that. I would not want that to be a fear that we don't believe. That we, I would not want that to be a fear that we don't go to be with God when we die. I don't want that to be something to take away our comfort, to make us uncomfortable because we go to be with God. Those I love who passed on are with God. That I believe. 
So what's the story say for us today to wrap it up? I mean, come on. It's in the Bible. Is it just for us to argue about ghosts? No. What it says to us is some really cool stuff. It says to us that, um, that we should never do things that we need to hide. The king had to go into disguise. So number one, we should never do anything we know that, that we have to hide. He hid as he went to see this medium. If he was doing something right, he wouldn't have had to hide. If it was, it, he would have gone in the daylight, he would have gone and not been ashamed of it. So be careful if we have to hide our behavior or our actions. That's a problem. Secondly, we should be consistent. He banned these type of folks from his community, but yet he goes and sees them. So he is not second, he's, we need to be consistent. And third, leadership means it matters what we do. Leadership can fall or stand on what we do. Our conduct matters. He was a failed leader because his actions did not match his beliefs. He knew God was God, but he didn't live like it. Fourth, it reminds us that God is bigger than all of us. God was bigger than King Saul, and God would replace King Saul if he could not behave. God is God, not Saul. And fifth and finally, it reminds us that we need to turn to God for our answers. When he showed up to talk to the prophet, the prophet ghost was quick to tell him what he already had been told, that he needed to follow God, and it was too late. He had failed God, and he'd been warned this before. He, he knew from Samuel what his responsibilities were when Samuel was alive and what it meant to be a king, and he had failed big time. So we need to turn to God, not mediums, not the horoscopes, not um, our own wisdom over God's wisdom, but we need to seek God's wisdom in all of our endeavors. Okay, this is an amazing tale. What a great ghost story to start with. Next week, we'll be digging into a monster from the deep, but what a great one to begin with. I hope this intrigues you. These stories are interesting, and they are unique. Mind you, they are very different. So, Next week, we will be digging into the, the beast from below, but for a afterthought and a reflection, hang on. So, tonight we talked about ghosts and mediums and spiritists, and I just would say to you that at the end of the day, I can't answer what happened in your ghost story. And I don't want to argue about it. it. It was your experience. But I do want to give you comfort that it's not someone you love trapped here forever, that you go to be with God through the power of Jesus Christ, um, and um, if, they, if they have trusted in Christ, you don't need to worry about if they are trapped in someone's attic. And I don't mean to be mean about that, but I, I would want to say, you know, I wouldn't want us to worry about it. But third, these stories, while out there and different, they draw us in. We'll never forget them. You'll never forget this about Saul speaking to the dead prophet. But they are reminders of the human nature, of human nature. Saul was a failed human being, just like many, all of us. And he kept, he kept, refusing to get back on track with God, and that's the saddest thing. God tries and tries to reach us, to remind us that we need to be faithful, that we need to trust God, that we need to have, our, that we need to really commit ourselves to God, and we are so rebellious. We constantly kick against God's will, kick against what God is trying to get us to do, and we pay for it. Saul paid dearly, and ultimately the kingdom paid for it. He caused a lot of problems in his kingdom. His sin had a impact among many. And so this is a story of a man who just couldn't get it and he kept on making a mess. May we do different. May we be better. May we be faithful. Thank you for joining us on the Witch of Endor story and I will see you next week in our Bible study.